now. Welcome to the Ask JP podcast, where we tackle the issues of the day, targeting them going straight head on. Uh, this is yet another episode in our criminal justice reform series. I have the distinct pleasure of having Judge Lori White with me, a very distinguished jurist who has been part of our criminal justice community for quite a while. Uh, Judge White, let's go, I'm going to go through a couple of her high points of her career and then and try to embarrass her too much. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Judge White was the judge who uncovered District Attorney Leon Canizero's use of fake subpoenas. And when she discovered this, she took him to task in open court, which started the entire process, which ended up in the appellate process regarding the use of fake subpoenas and how ridiculously illegal they were targeting domestic violence victims. As a criminal defense attorney, she secured the first exoneration by DNA, DNA evidence under Louisiana law. Working with the New York Ancestors Project, she used a newly passed state law to prove a defendant not guilty using DNA evidence. She's been an advocate of our community. She's organized and hosted community events like the Racial Justice Improvement CLE on Post-Conviction Education and Community Awareness Clinic on Reentry Court. Uh, Governor John Bell Edwards appointed uh, Judge White to the Louisiana Sentencing Commission and Louisiana Justice Reinvestment Task Force, where she helped craft the comprehensive plan for safely reducing the state's highest in the nation in imprisonment rate. She single-handedly working with, the, with Governor Edwards led to a tremendous statewide reduction in our prison population. And once again, as a criminal defense attorney, she got a wrongful life sentence convictions overturned when she discovered prosecutors failed to hand over exculpatory evidence during the trial. In one case, Lori secured the release of Larry Hudson, a New Orleans longshoreman, after he'd already served 26 years in Angola for a crime he did not commit. So that's a brief overview uh, of Judge White's very impressive career. Uh, but time is of the essence. I know she's got work to do. So we're going to get right into the question and answer section. Unless Judge White, you want to answer, add something before we get into it. That's exhausting. 30 years <laughs> summed up. You did a great job. But I'm so tired. I have to color my hair regularly to keep the old age at bay. <laughs> okay. Well, let's get, let's get uh, started. Did you, the first question I typically ask is, why do you want to be a criminal court judge? Let me ask you a variation of that. Why do you still want to be a criminal court judge? <laughs> I think you froze out there for a second. Give it a second. I can't tell. Okay, you're back. Okay. Yeah. You know, I want to keep doing what I've been doing, which is make a difference in the courtroom. And I'm really looking forward to continuing my reentry program, which I started in 2010. And I did it for seven years without any staffing or funding. And in the last year, um, I got a federal grant for a million dollars over the next three years. And I got a justice reinvestment grant of uh, 600,000 for the next three years. And none of the other judges, you know, it was Judge Hunter and I, and Judge Hunter has left the bench. So um, I'm gonna continue and hope I can get some new judges to work with us. And then uh, Judge Ben Willard has agreed to do some work with us. So I'm looking forward to doing that. I'm also looking forward to having a new district attorney and seeing how our justice system will change in New Orleans. I think that's a very important change that we're all gonna experience. So uh, also I, had a huge docket when I took over uh, Section A in 2008. It was like three or 400 cases. And I'm now down to less than 100 open uh, felony cases. And that changes everything about how much, how quickly you can proceed and get people to trial or get the district attorney's office to, to make a decision on a plea offer. So that makes a big difference. Uh, one year I tried 53 jury trials. <laughs> to try to get my docket reduced. So when your docket's now down to, you know, less than a hundred cases, your, your days are not as exhausting. That's very fair. Um, for those of, for those people who've never experienced Judge White and unfortunately, or unfortunately, unless you're a prosecutor, <laughs> a public defender or a defendant, they shouldn't have to experience Judge White. But for those people who come to your courtroom, what should they expect? How should they expect to be treated? What's your judicial philosophy when dealing with the public? Well, I actually try to show a lot of kindness to the participants, as in the defendants, 
and the witnesses and the victims. I'm much harsher on lawyers because I expect lawyers to be timely. And I don't expect everybody to be sitting there like robots waiting for court to start, but I want them to be ready for trial or ready for a motion hearing that day. And I'm pretty hard on police officers if they show up to testify and they can't answer the questions that the lawyers are asking them because they have not read a police report. I will ask them to step off the bench to go read their police report because basically I remind them that what they do out on the street, the reason for that is what they're coming to court for. So I want people prepared and I want them to, to know their law or to know what process, but I always offer um, drug or depression or mental health treatment to anybody that any defendant that comes into court i make sure and i and i always ask them has anybody ever offered you you know drug treatment because i do drug screen and i tell them when they're in my court i want them to be off marijuana because it's not legal and i don't want that to be a reason that a police officer has to stop them for probable cause to then let them get another charge because i'm then going to have to increase the bond or um they're going to have more cases and so it's going to be more trouble for them so okay. i try to offer help well i, I think that's, that's that's a great place to, to lead to our next one um as just judge, know too that it's very scary to come into court you know that, so that, i'm aware that, of that i'm sure the public appreciates that what is as a, as a current judge over over at criminal district court what is the state of the judiciary in criminal district court currently at tulane and broad well, we are operating at two days a week in court, but we're doing Zoom in court. So just like you and I are meeting by Zoom, I handle my docket from Zoom. I'm sitting at the bench. My now, which we've just moved into the phase three portion, the district attorney, assistant district attorney is sitting in court with me. My minute clerk is there and my court reporter. So basically my staff and then in the jail where they're not bringing inmates into court, but they're appearing via, via video through Zoom. And so they're in a room in the jail and they appear on video with me. The lawyers, uh, we usually have one public defender in court and the rest of the public defenders and the private lawyers are appearing either on their phones, from their cars. Some of them have their clients with them and some of them are at another location appearing by Zoom. And we're also allowing uh, defendants that are on bond to now come into court with no more than 10 people in court at a time. So we've, you know, we've set up Zoom in our courtroom for um, a person that's on bond to stand across the room and to be on the Zoom camera with me literally in court so that their lawyer can see them and talk to them. So um, we're, we're having some difficulty because of course everything I say in court is recorded. And it's very hard to understand people with a mask on and for the court reporter to take it down. Uh, so I am behind plexiglass and of course I'm higher in the courtroom and further away from everybody. So I take my mask off to Yeah, I'm gonna pause. Yeah. Okay, you're back. I'm not agreeing to, to, it says my internet connection is unstable. Are you able to hear me? I can hear you. You pause occasionally, but we're working through it. Okay. I okay. can try another room if you want. Yeah. Uh, you, you, well, so, well, we're, 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 why don't we move to the next question and just, let's just get, let's just try and progress okay. this. So uh, on the following issues, just real quick. Let's figure out kind of where you're at. You've been a judge. So these are not like hypotheticals. You're dealing with them currently. What is your right. position on cash bail? I think, first of all, I'd like the legislature to not prohibit us for ROR bonds on all crimes. But first of all, when, when I take a position on cash bail, there are many crimes that people are arrested for that I can't give them anything but a cash bail. So that's something that I think everybody needs to understand. Secondly, I would like to give more ROR's with conditions, drug treatment, uh, reporting to pretrial services, coming back to my court and me seeing them 
to maybe drug screen them because many times people say they don't have a drug problem but after a couple of screens and I see that they may have the holy trinity or three or four different drugs then I'm like you know what you probably do have a drug problem and we need to maybe get some help for that and so I'm interested in personal accountability I wish that the statutes would allow for uh, an individual to post a cash bond of like a smaller amount and say a thousand dollars and then if they do not come back they lose it but if they come back we give it back to them you know that's what i think we need to be doing i think those are the types of surety bonds and personal surety bonds i'd like mothers to be able to um, sign out for their children and if they don't come back then the then the mother knows they're accountable to me to bring them back. I think all those things make for more personal. I don't think it should be a money-making system. It should be a system to get people to court. Okay. Um, what are your thoughts on mandatory minimums? Because I'm sure you you deal with it constantly in your position as judge. You have people that come in and the district attorney chooses to multi-bill them or triple bill them or whatever. What's your opinion on mandatory minimums? And do you think they're effective? Um, I don't like them. Um, I don't like mandatory minimums because again, I'm, I think judges who are elected by the people for the people should be able to apply their discretion in every case and you have to take into consideration what the victims want, what the defendant has done, what the criminal history is. And so mandatory minimums, um, I use, I'm required by law to follow mandatory minimums, but a mandatory minimum doesn't mean that you have to go above it either. So in many cases, when it's a mandatory minimum, that's the minimum I'm giving them. You know, it's not like I'm going above it, but I am a serious sentencer when it's a violent crime. So mandatory minimums have changed a lot, thankfully, through the re uh, Justice Reinvestment Task Force. But the ones that are still there, um, I'm looking forward to a district attorney that doesn't use a multiple bill as a, as a plea bargain. Because at this point, anybody that has a prior felony conviction, the district attorney says, well, we're going to multiple bill you if you don't plead guilty and take seven years. And so the district attorney has, this district attorney, Ken Azero, has learned to use it as a plea bargaining and a threat over their heads or a carrot, if you want to, for them to maybe take a higher sentence when if it was left up to me to provide sentencing, which a judge, that's the purpose of having a judge, we should be allowed to set what that sentence should be, not the district attorney. Okay. Uh, death penalty. I know that I'm going to bifurcate this question. What's your personal position on death penalty and what is, how have you seen it in application and what have you done with death penalty cases as a judge? Got a little bit of pause. I'm the only judge that on the bench at present, you got me? Yeah, Is it you. working? Yeah, it's working. Okay. I'm the only judge on the bench that's been cuter trying death penalty cases to conclusion and also a criminal defense lawyer trying death penalty cases to conclusion and now I'm a judge handling those. I've also handled direct appeals for death penalty um, defendants. I've also handled federal habeas cases and post-conviction release for death penalty. I think if I, I think if I had a family member that um, was killed, I think that's who should make the decision of whether they wish someone to be um, tried for the death penalty. I don't think that it's something that as a prosecutor or as a defense lawyer, I didn't think it was, it was justice and it didn't feel like we were spending the right amount of time and preparation because when that money is spent, it becomes very expensive because you do need to have a jury since they're making the ultimate sentence of death, then they should know everything. And that was always what I felt like my responsibility was, that the jury needed to be certain and have enough information to know that, that when you make that ultimate sentence, that it's the thing to do. And the death penalty is not something that I would ever defend or prosecute again. Okay. I've been on both sides of it and, it, and I found it miserable. Okay. Um, judicial activism. I think you, you've already kind of have a history of this, but the, <laughs> there, there, there are two schools of thought on judicial activism. There are some people who say judges just stay in their lane, 
just do what's been done previously, not change or do anything different. Judicial activism is bad. We hate activist judges. On the other side, there's the argument of if you see something, say something. If you think something's unjust or you think something's not proper, judges should be able to weigh in on it. Where do you think you fall in that kind of equation? Let's give it a second. I want to hear from you probably. Yep, I can hear you again now. Oh, I lost her. Let's see. Yeah. So, sorry. Uh, back to the previous question. So, as I was saying, you are, the question is, judicial activism so there are two people two schools of thought one is you know judges should just do what that do what has been done previously don't change anything the law is the law you can't if you, if you just got to do whatever the law says the other end of the spectrum is if you see something say something if the law is not correct if it's being interpreted wrong you should make it your life's goal to interpret the way you think it should be interpreted where do you think you fall on that spectrum Oh, I'm definitely what some people would uh, find as a terrible judicial activist, but I think I'm a fabulous judicial activist because I started the reentry program, first of all. That has put judges in a position all over this state because it's now statewide and it was the first reentry court. I invented it with at the legislature. You were there. You helped. And what we've done is we're now working with the prison system on rehabilitation so that people sitting in jail are learning skills and getting their GEDs and they're coming out to do something other than recidivate. And when you think about, people should understand judicial uh, activism. For example, here's something I did. Tell me if this is a good thing or bad thing. That's what the voters can decide. <laughs> the NOPD used to have a policy that every time they arrested someone that was on a bicycle, whether that bicycle was involved in the crime or not, they would seize the bicycle and put it into evidence or personal property with the um, NOPD. That ended up taking up so much valuable real estate in the evidence room that NOPD was paying hundreds of thousand dollars a month <laughs> to store all of those bicycles that weren't needed. So when I saw this, I worked with NOPD and the DA's office and everyone. And we did all the paperwork that was required to return those bicycles to their rightful owners. And would you believe 1,200 bicycles ended up not belonging or being claimed? So I had those bicycles picked up. I signed the orders with the district attorney's office agreeing. And I had all those bicycles sent out to Angola State Penitentiary. And men in the prison refurbished those bicycles. And then I gave them away with the ceasefire program and the uh, Loyola Inn of Court, St. Thomas More Inn of Court, and my reentry program. So we gave 1,200 bicycles away for three years to local kids. That is amazing. That is a great story. And a sentencing commission. Did, I, did you lose me? It just said my internet's unstable again. Yeah, I don't know it's, what's it's, going on today. It's, it's okay. So you're, you're the chair of the governor's reentry program, reentry commission. But, well, the governor's sentencing uh, commission. Right. And I'm working with all the different stakeholders, district attorneys, sheriffs, clerks of court, defense lawyers, prosecutors. I want sentences. Oh, Lord. That's me. Sorry. That's okay. All right. I want sentences when a person stands in front of me and their lawyer explains the sentence to them and the victim thinks that someone is pleading to say 10 years. I want everybody to know how long the person's going to do in jail. I want truth in sentencing. I want the district uh, attorney's office to be able to say whether if it's a multiple bill or a violent offense or if it's um, if it's entitled to good time. So I'm working, if the Bureau of Prisons can give you a release date, then why can't the Department of Corrections not have to use a, an abacus and, a, and whether it's a full moon or not to determine what kind of sentence someone does? 
So I think that that's something that we're working with to try to get more truth in sentencing because there's a lot of lawsuits against the Department of Corrections because it looks like they may be holding people over time. No one should ever stay over their jail sentence. So that's that's some of my quote uh, progressive thinking for the future. Okay. Um, what's it like campaigning during COVID? Weird. <laughs> it's like a touchless car wash. You know, I have to, uh, you know, not touch anybody. And it's very odd for me because I'm, you know, I, I, I'm uncomfortable going around because I'm afraid I may be the carrier because I am out and about more than a lot of people that are still very isolated. So, you know, I've, I've not gone to any old folks homes or nursing homes. I'm not hanging out with older people because I don't want to be the cause of any type of illness. And, you know, I can't, you can't raise any, you can't have a fundraiser because nobody can all get together. So that's odd. So, you know, a lot of internet, I've had uh, probably 25 Zooms and this is the first one I'll have, you know, JP, and I'm really sorry, that's had, um, you know, internet connection issues. So I'm pretty lucky to only we're, have one out of we're, all of we're, we're all at the mercy of Cox and at and <laughs> during this time. So I don't hold it. Yes, they are. It, 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 it. Everyone has a different kind of experience with Zoom based on the day. And it's just kind of exactly. the nature of, nature of the beast. So I do recall that I had to get in my car one day to finish a Zoom call. <laughs> <laughs> okay, last major question. Why are you more qualified than your opponent? So, so many reasons. I've been a prosecutor. I was a criminal defense lawyer. I was lead counsel. I have um, probably as a, a, a prosecutor and a criminal defense lawyer, I was lead counsel in jury trials for over 120 juries. I was an appellate attorney as a private lawyer and there are over 250 cited cases in the Southern Seconds that I was the original uh, lawyer writing the brief and arguing it before the court. I've gotten cases where, as you heard, the DNA exoneration. I also have multiple cases in which I, um, before there was a movement called Black Lives Matter, I was handling cases of people that couldn't afford a lawyer out at the prison. And I gave my time every year for free. And for example, Norris Henderson, who's one of our community uh, leaders, and he works with the vote organization. I represented Norris for many years for free and got his conviction, got him released on his con from his conviction. Um, I've had many cases where the prosecutors had withheld Brady material and I got those cases reversed. I handled the heroin lifers in which uh, they could either get probation or a life sentence and I managed to get most of the last ones out of prison because they'd been in prison 20, 30 years. Then I was a prosecutor that put people in jail. So my experience is, is vast. Um, I have proven in the 13 years I've been uh, an anti Canazero supporter. And in fact, we have been very public in our disagreements. And um, he would kick me to get other judges in line, but I, I've always ruled courageously with the freedom to do what I thought was right without fear of political influence or retribution. And I've had plenty of political retribution as a result of that. And I'm still here. All right. Well, is there anything else you'd like to add today? I'm ready to go back. My number is 86. And if you've been in a restaurant, that means you've run out of something. And I have not run out of anything and especially <laughs> energy. So number 86, uh, Judge Lori White. And do, you, do you have any Twitter or Facebook you want to plug right quick? I do. It's judgelorywhite.org. Judgelorywhite.org. Okay. Thank right. you, JP. Thank you so much, Good Judge White. I appreciate you working with me. I appreciate you having me. Thanks so much. All the best. Bye.